Welcome to the Photo Funky Show, episode 148. Today's episode, we're going to be talking about food photography, particularly with uh, food prep for recipes. Hi, my name is William Beam. Hi, my name is Lee Beam. And we are here to help you improve your photography with visual storytelling. And honestly, that's what this food prep photo shoot that Lee did recently was all about. It is visual storytelling. It's really, you needed to share something with your audience on carefreerunner.com mm-hmm. and the photos help you tell that story. Yeah. So before we get into that, I just want to let you know that show notes are going to be available at williambeam.com slash episode 148. And if Lee's nice, maybe she'll let me have some of her photos to put up there so you can see it. And we'll also put a link to her recipes on uh, carefreerunner.com. Okay. Yeah, that's cool with me. All right. So let's let's go ahead and start with the concept. Why did you need this? I am very meticulous with my diets. And it's just something that I've found. more. The more I do it, the more I need to do it. I, I need to be careful what I eat. Um, but also, I have a really somewhat chaotic and crazy lifestyle. I have very, very long days that involve early mornings and I also work nights. And there really isn't much, if any, downtime during the day for me. It's just my days are scattered. So for me to adhere to my, my, my nutrition standards and needs, I find that preparing food in advance is, um, is a key to my success. The weeks that I don't do it fully, or completely, or I don't, I, there've been times where I just have been too busy and haven't done it all. The entire week just crashes down as far as meal times are concerned. All right. So you do this pretty much every Sunday. Yes. Dedicated yeah. to meal prep. And that's, yes. that's for both you and at least for lunch for Tofe. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. And not my stuff. Some, some <laughs> stuff that is for your meals. Yes. Is food prepped. It's not the meal itself, but I have a system where, you know, for example, I, chop onions to go in salads that chop onions to go maybe in totally stir fry or some pasta thing that she's having you like chopped onions with some of the meals that you have so instead of chopping a fresh onion every time i'll just hack into <laughs> two or three onions i seal it up in an airtight container and stick in the fridge so when i need it's ready and i just scoop out of the ready prepared you know how you get those ready made um ready chopped cut washed you know it's kind of good to use things but- that but you've got a good knife set and you just go there and chop I your just own go stuff. ahead and chop my own. And I don't have to portion that because there's stuff that I call general use stuff. There's also stuff that, you know, for me with my diet, anything, you know, leafy greens don't need to be measured. You can eat as much as you like. So I don't measure those, I, but I get them washed first. All right. So you do this every Sunday, but mm-hmm. for some reason on this particular Sunday, you decided that you wanted to take photos as you go through this. What, I did. what was driving that? All right. I, um, I work with clients who many uh, many of them are either trying to lose weight or they're trying to enhance performance or to kind of build a certain type of body. And it's it's like the old saying that says abs are made in the kitchen. It It's true. You can do so much in a gym, but really 80% of what you do comes down to your nutrition. And I have found that those who get it and who follow and take the counseling and guidance and encouragement for the food prep are way more successful than those who don't. When we, it's my first stop when somebody says, I, you know, I'm not seeing any results. The first thing I ask them is how's the food prep going? Yeah, I don't have time for that. Well, that's why you don't have time to eat. Okay. So you've, you wanted to do this to share Mm -hmm. with your clients and we've got this up on your website. I mean, you wrote the articles to go with that. All right. So let me, let me ask you this as far as what was your concept as far as, do you want to show the steps that you're taking to prepare or were you showing the finished meal? And then you were describing that on your blog post, which, which way was it going? I was doing both. Uh, Really? I believe that if I'm looking up a recipe or looking for instructions, I want to see, I, I want to scroll ahead or read through and get to some kind of graphic image of the end result. Because you can go through all the instructions and if it's not something that's familiar to you or not something that you can envisage, it is, um, I think the final photo tells a story and can save you a lot of hassle if this is like something I went. The first step is somebody wants to see the end before they even begin. They say like, I'm I'm either going to eat this, it looks interesting, or I have no interest in that and I don't care how you put it together. Yeah, pretty much. Okay, so you need to start with the, 
you didn't obviously take the last photo first, but you're presenting it that way. But assuming that they want to follow this recipe and they like what they saw in the, in the final image, what did you show them along the way? I mean, was it a matter of getting the ingredients together? Was it how you cut them up or what, what did you do? It, it was both. In fact, I had a series of photos. Not everything is up on the blog yet. I've got a couple of very short things that are on the blog. What it did, um, I was also sharing directly with clients and some of these were cell phone photos to accompany this because I needed to be quick with it. But what I was doing was showing them how I set up. So it started with, I like to work in a clean kitchen because if you don't have space, it's really difficult to be organized and it's easy for your mind to get overwhelmed. So you made sure that the workspace, I mean, you went through and cleaned everything. You moved all the clutter off the kitchen counters. Yep. But there was one counter where you set for, this is where I'm going to take my photos. The other counters were where you're going to do your work. That's correct. Why did you keep that separate? I never work where I'm taking my photos. That is presentation. The work happens somewhere else. Okay, so the presentation area, that's where we set up the light and the background and, and everything you needed. That is not where you do your work because you don't want to spill or slop You do it not want any marks. And the thing is, it doesn't matter what kind of surface you're working on, unless it's some kind of vinyl, marble, or a plastic. As soon as you spill something on there, for example, I had wood, I had materials and fabrics and things, you know, in, in you had cutting various, boards. You had, I had cutting boards. You don't want it, something wet gets on the cutting board or spills. This doesn't dry in a minute. Yeah. And I'm trying to work through. I was literally working and taking photos at the same time, which did slow me down. But that is just part of the process. But one of the key tips, though, was your presentation area is not a working area. So that way you don't have anything that messes up your presentation area. That is correct. The other thing, and this might sound a little bit obvious, but it was something that I had to think about carefully the first time I did it, probably about a year ago, when I'm, you know, if I'm chopping up lettuce and carrots, for example, on a chopping board, and I want to show my chopped lettuce and carrots on the chopping board. Maybe I'm showing the ingredients, maybe it's just for a cover, you know, for a, a title, a header image. But I don't want to have all the mess and the, the debris from the chopping in my photos. So what I would do is I would chop it somewhere else and then I would slide, I would use like a, a spatula and slide the things onto the presentation board yeah, you and were, take a photo of them there. It wasn't just the spatula. Even after you got it there, you were picking things up and, and putting them where they looked best. I went to arrange them because this is for a photo. And, you know, the integrity is still there. I'm still showing the ingredients. But when it comes to photographing food, this is about, it really is about telling a story. And this is where, you know, when I'm chopping up food to make myself a salad, I'm not thinking about presentation or how things are aligned. But when you're trying to show something to somebody, those visuals are important. Those It might be a visual that draws somebody and not everybody learns by reading text. You know, most people are drawn in by color, by, you know, light, something's clear. There are various ways that you can get somebody's attention. So I don't want all my greens on one side and all my other colors kind of mixed as a big hash on the other side. I actually work this very carefully and I chose my backgrounds carefully in accordance with what i was shooting well why don't we start off with kind of your set area your, your presentation area mm -hmm. how we set that up and then i want to go into talking about how you changed from one item to the next okay so we started this off with uh, we've got a like a little kitchen counter that comes out kind of almost in a u-shape in our kitchen and that counter was open the back end of it from her, from her position opens up into our dining room and we had for a background you know it it didn't really flow just looking off into, you know, the furniture, the dining yeah. room table and stuff. So we put up a last to light collapsible background and there are several of them out there. The one that we used for this one is uh, tobacco on one side and olive on the other side. And they look kind of like a, a painted canvas. Yes. And which one you chose the olive side, I think. I believe I chose the olive side because I had wood and I wanted something that would kind of, I didn't want a uniform color. Right. We wanted something that was very neutral, mm -hmm. but still, you know, like you said, you didn't want the wood going into the, to the tobacco side. Just That's correct. So you didn't have brown on brown. Yeah. So we set that up. We just, uh, and I'll put links to these in the show notes, but basically it's a Manfrotto light stand. And then there is a magnetic bar that kind of goes off with two magnets that holds it in place. And that, that's available in a little kit. So I'll put that in the uh, notes. 
And then we've bought a few of these uh, last light collapsible backgrounds. And this one we just recently got. So it's the first time yeah. we've used it on this shoot. I thought it worked very well. I love the colors. And I really wanted something neutral for food photography for this. Because this allowed me to do dark photos but there's also the potential to do something where you're going way lighter and generally with food i want something with a warm background now mm -hmm. that's not always because i did do some that didn't include the background where i literally shot top down i stood on a three three tier step stool i'm short it, you know that gave me the variety the background was there i didn't have to move things around i mean once once it was set up nothing moved yeah, you had you had both the bird's eye view from being on the step stool, and you could also shoot and use the background, which is not a big part of the scene, and it doesn't need to be because it's not the star. Yeah. It was simply supporting your photos of the food. Now, for lighting, I brought in a C-stand with really a simple kit. We used a single um, Evolve 200, or if you're in the Godox, that would be the AD 200. So that light worked. I think we shot it like 16th power or something it was it was not taking a lot of power out of it so no you, there were there were times that i i mean there were certain shots we where i really bit. yeah there were some where i really increased it and but generally the 16 was about where it was and we had a single soft box and that was again a last light easy box 24 by 24 inch and it was the joe mcnally version and the reason i chose that one is because it has a white interior and you don't get as much specularity out of the light. In other words, you don't have those bright, harsh, you know, shiny spots on your subject yeah. with the white interior. It's people worry about like, well, if I get the white interior, I don't get as much power from my flash. I thought it's not about the power you get from a flash. It's about how does your subject look? Yeah. So this one with the white background really worked well for the food photography. It really did. Yeah. And it was, you know, on a, like I said, on a C stand so we could move it over and you were shooting with a light kind of coming, I'd say from an, an eight o'clock position from where you were standing. That's right. Just kind of at an angle mm -hmm. and maybe 45 degrees down in eight o'clock position from where she was standing. And that was a consistent light source for you all the way through. It was. You now we've seen other food, food photography that looks beautiful when it's backlit. Like if you have window light and the lights coming over it, that works too. But we didn't really have that in our house. So we worked with this and I think it, it really worked very well. It did. But you know, also, I mean, keeping my, my, I always like to try and simplify things as much as possible. I'm not putting all of these photos into one post. I'm basically doing some very short tips and eventually there will, there, there is a blog post that's going to combine the elements of everything, you know, for, for a much more in-depth story about it and, and some guidance and help. These are not all going to be seen at the same time. And also the other thing is I'm not afraid of having some consistency. So if that is, you know, I've started shooting with these. If we picked up some wooden boards from Michael's, I mean, they are wood. They're not very big. It is actual wood slats. And I needed two of them stacking two. Kind of side by kind side. Of side, by words, side. They, they hook together kind of like if you were doing pergo flooring or something yeah, like that. Yeah, you can just like push them against each other and it you, you couldn't tell it's in two sections. But this has really become my go-to background anytime that I'm shooting products. And at first, you know, I thought, well, I'll see where I can use this. But well, honestly, I, I thought, you know what? This is my look. When people see this, it's mine. Well, it looks so, like an old farm table. It really does. And I hadn't originally got that with food photography in mind. I really wanted a background for some other product stuff that I do for reviews. But it works so well. And well, it's a nice neutral color. We push it up against the olive, you know, background on that last light collapsible backdrop. And and the two colors work very de mm -hmm. well together, but they were not competing with your food or what you were putting on top They're of it. They're both very neutral, but I like that there was so much texture in the front. And also I opened up the aperture quite a bit because I didn't want too much distraction or definition with the background. I really just wanted the color to come through. And... I think having the texture in the foreground is really helpful. You mentioned that you were doing some of the shots with your iPhone. I think that's where like in your work areas. This I one was, you were using your DSLR. What was that a D7000? D7000. And which lens did you end up with? I, um, <laughs> was it the 35 or the 85? I can't remember. I, I picked up the 35 and I actually loved the 85, but where I was standing in that small space, the 35, I, I needed the width of the 35. I also pulled out the 24 to 70, assuming that that's what I was going to use for the majority of my shots. But quite honestly, 
I just balanced and worked on some stability drills and I, I moved around. But once I got started with it, I thought, you know what? This is fine. I really like to keep things simple and keep things So flowing. you just kind of moved your camera and in and out. And I decided this is, the, this is the lens I'm using. It's working for these shots. If I cannot get things into the frame properly, it means I need to move. Okay, so you're using a 35 millimeter on a crop sensor Nikon body. Mm -hmm. If you're doing this and maybe you have a full frame sensor, maybe you might want to go with a 50 millimeter instead of the 35. Uh, yeah, for sure. But overall, the idea was that you moved in and out I did. To, to get the compositions that you wanted and it, it worked for you. I, I do love that lens. And a, a good quality 50, 50 is my preference over 35. Uh, it, it's just something because I generally do get inside. I could have worked with a 50, but the 50 that I have, I don't know what you have. The 50 that I have is not terribly sharp unless you use manual focus. And quite honestly, this this was like a... You had too much work to do. This was several hours and I really did need to get the work done as well as the photos. So I, I already had a lot of pressure on me on what was had started out as a working day. So, yeah, it was just trying to be practical. I may do things differently in the future, but sometimes you just got to take what you have and if it works, stop overthinking it. It works, use it. We know about how the lighting was, the lens and the camera and stuff and what we use for the backdrop. Now, let's talk about the subjects. What were you putting down both as the food that you're preparing and as the things that you're using to accessorize it? Because you had, you know, some napkins, you had some different colored cutting boards. How did that come together? All right. Actually, the cutting boards, I had one cutting board that I used for display throughout. Mm -hmm. It, It really was just one. As far as napkins, they're not really napkins. I go into craft stores and when they have any five for a dollar of, they, they're called, uh, what do they call the scraps them here? The, basically. Of quarters, uh, something quarters. And they're called something different here. They call them fat quarters in, in Europe. It's not what they call them here. So I hope that doesn't mean anything. <laughs> That's terrible. But really, it, it, I go into a craft store. I usually go into Giants. And it, it is off cuts um, when they're measuring material and there's a little bit left over the roll and i go in and i pick these things up and what i do when i go in is try and get different colors i get different patterns different textures so i like something that's and these are for splashes of color i've got some browns i've got some soft colors but generally these are to add splashes of colors into a scene and they haven't been hemmed or anything so you've got kind of the, the fraying edges where there's bits of threads coming out all i do is i kind of tuck them under and arrange them so I use these as though they were napkins or a tablecloth or anything that might go with this. It it really is just because they're such small sets. I mean, I'm getting in really tight. I don't need something big. Okay. So also the utensils and thing and bowls that you put in place. The very first shot you did was just measuring spoons, like metal measuring spoons mm-hmm. with different spices in them. Yes. Kind of fanned out. And, and I really love that shot. That was just against the, the wood backdrop that you were talking Actually, about. Actually, it wasn't against the wood backdrop. I bought a book of, uh, they are... Oh, that was the paper. Nine, is it nine by nine? I, I believe they're nine by nine inch square uh, scrapbook uh, papers. They, they're called scrapbook backing papers. And you can buy these in any craft store. You'll get a book of them. Or you can buy single sheets. And this was just made to look like wood. Um, kind of really finely sanded wood and i used that i actually bought these i I used some other backgrounds but i like the wood the most just to kind of try out with the different colors all right we want to get into the post-processing later but the reason i want to bring this up right now while we're talking about it i thought that was the actual wood when i was looking at it on your laptop when you were doing your post-processing and i made the suggestion that you lower the exposure Mm -hmm. and it really seemed to bring out the detail and grain in the wood yeah which now i know is paper i thought it was wood it does but but it i mean these little backdrops whether we're talking about the collapsible backdrop that we had that looks like a painted canvas or this piece of paper that just looks like wood in the photograph it looks like the real thing i mean i I believed it I thought you had shot that on wood. I didn't realize that was no, one of your papers. No, that was paper. I th- actually, all of the ones with the spoons were done on paper. Oh, that's cool. The thing with filling up spoons, and I, I'll you know, I'll let you take that photo so you can put it up to demonstrate. It looks so simple, but when you've got spoons that are linked together, and you're trying you want to fan to fill, them out, you're trying to fan them out. You've got spices. I I actually arrange these with colors very specifically, and. When you move something 
loose powders and spices and seeds and things fall down. Yeah. And when they fall down, it's not as simple as just going and blowing it up. So you you got to you got to um I had to be very very careful not to make a mess with this. And I mean, I literally just took my fingertip and had to dab up. I think there were some hot chili pepper seeds that's um that fell down. But what I did was I've got a I've got some really cheap plastic funnels in the kitchen that I use for some of my pre-workouts and I use those so I actually scooped I held the funnel over the spoon and I scooped the whatever the spice was and funneled it into the spoon rather than trying to fill them separately because that would have made a mess and something to keep in mind with that is always start with your whatever ingredient leaves the least residue it's the same for doing photos when you've got your working surface try and start with things that are dry or things that you've where you've been able to soak up the excess water so if you've got something wet like watermelon or something juicy like you're slicing oranges you want to do these last nobody knows in what order you shot your photos but start with the what i call the clean dirt like stuff that's easy to dust or wipe away on your boards unless you've got something like marble where you literally can wipe it clean or if you have several of them Actually, that's a good tip because, like you said, you want to think about what's the messiest thing. If you start with that, then you then everything else is going to be on a mess. Yeah, you always end with the messiest thing because once you're done, you that, that's fine. Okay, so what what kind of things are we putting down there? I remember, like we've got a bowl of rice. We obviously had the spices. Some of it's going to be lettuce and tomato. What what else were you doing? I mean, were you thinking about the colors and how they go together, or how are you presenting this? I did. Well, honestly, I was. I I wanted to be genuine. There are really simple. It's almost a bit of a nerve to call them recipes, but I try and make. We, you know, our daughter eats like maybe five different foods and then gets bored because she's eating the same thing all the time. Mm-hmm. So, for example, I took the rice. She discovered, I'll let her taste some jasmine rice. and She said, oh, I like that. So I thought, okay, there's a different type of rice I can do. Now, this works with any rice, but she does like cilantro and she loves her citrus fruits. So I thought, well, I wonder if what this would be like if I chopped up some cilantro and put some lime zest and fresh lime juice squeezed in there when I cook it. So I tried it and she loved it. So that was something I thought is really simple that I can share with people because you get tired of doing the same thing. So this was not, you you know, I had the recipes or the little tips and things that I wanted to do. I knew what I was going to do. I wanted to do what I was already cooking for ourselves. I didn't make anything specially for the photo shoot. Mm -hmm. So to answer your question, yes, there are, I did think about the colors and how they work together, but for each dish that I was preparing, I had to work with the colors that are part of that dish. That's it. And the way that I offset some of those or put some contrast in was often with a um with, with some of that material or something like that. Okay. I've I've looked at some various, you know, food photos. Obviously ever we've all seen them, you know, different places, but I remember one shot that I that I really liked was just French toast. And if you look at French toast, it's just brown. It's kind of boring. And they sprinkled some blueberries over top of it and just added that splash of color. Yeah. I like blueberries in my pancakes. I don't know if I really want them on top of my French toast. So it wasn't necessarily a presentation the way I would eat it, but it made for an interesting photo. But you were showing this kind of prepared as you would serve it. I really should. And we ate it. This is the food that we ate last week. Um, It it really is. Now, look, there's nothing wrong with taking photos and presenting things to create art or beautiful photos and that doesn't make it a bad dish or a bad recipe but that really wasn't your purpose here my purpose is to share with people who are sitting there and feeling like i don't know this is so complicated i i don't think i can do this and what i'm trying to show them is mine is very simple i'm not this great cook or anything this is everyday food and i have a family who eat differently to me and this is stuff that kids will eat and it looked very good and it wasn't just a matter of that this was something that tove liked to eat it the presentation was very good the food looks very good the photos i think look very good so let's jump ahead now in the post-processing you did okay. pretty much everything in lightroom i did everything in lightroom right, including so, my, my cell phone photos <laughs> okay so what was your process there the first thing i did was i selected my photos with this one because I had so many and I was under a lot of time pressure, it was really hard to, at a glance with the thumbnails, to decide which ones to import. 
So I had to kind of work backwards and say, okay, there were some that I knew that I didn't need. And it really was a case of importing the best of like ones. Usually if I've taken a ton of photos, if, if I'm taking a photo of cucumber on a chopping board with a knife next to it, and I've taken 25 shots of that, I know that the last few are probably the ones I'm going to like the most. Okay. So what I'm looking is at is two things that I have different angles and crops, in which case the last two of each set would be the ones that I would import. And I really just take my chances with that. I did not go back and have a look to see oh, maybe this or maybe that. And the, they're still there on the card. I haven't gone through So you, you still went through your editing process to pick the winners that you wanted to do. Once you had those selected, what was your development or post-processing process? The first thing I do is I select them all and I apply tags to them. Mm -hmm. And I have certain tags for certain things. So there were entire tags that fell under, you know, like maybe my blog name and food prep category, recipes and things like that. There are a number of tags. Then I had to select batches of them. And there was something else that maybe listed the ingredients, the type of dish or more detail on it. So okay. I had to, you know, it's, it takes a little while, but just a few extra but basically, minutes. If you, if you don't take the time and do it right then. You probably won't go back and do it later on. I would and then, never think to And go then you back. can't find them. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So once I've done that, I go in and I, I take a look at, I scroll through, you know, you've got the little, like the strip at the bottom with Lightroom. If you have that displayed, mm -hmm. you can scroll along in the develop module. I'll actually click on the first picture and take a look at it. Uh, scroll along and just randomly click on the first pe picture from each sort of set or, you know, each different arrangement. And I kind of get an idea for how the lighting was or what was happening. I just get a general overview. Then I go and I select all of them. And I'm not going to keep them all, but I select them all and I do the lens correction mm -hmm. and all the, the you know, the stuff that's going to be the same on it. The you... stuff that's going to be the same is done because things like exposure are different. Things like color temperature are going to be different. Those sort of things. But you use the one lens. So I use the one lens. So I was able to do things like that. As far as sharpening, I go in and I do some basic things. So I don't go extreme with any. I can tweak it once I get to the photos I want. Okay. And I just do some basic sharpening. I do a little bit of... Um, Usually, like I have a look and I can get a general feel like in this case, the highlights, I could pull the highlights down a little bit on all of them. Yeah. Um, I could pull the exposure a little bit down on all of them. Some of them I took it back to zero or maybe even just above, but that's that's for um, reference. Really, I look at getting, it's almost like taking a, a, what do you call it when you get like an auto, um, you know, when you used to click something, it was a magic fix they used to have a name for that if you remember those you used to get these presets that oh yeah i know what you're talking about you know about. what i'm like, talking about but, but basically like you put a preset on you, it, it yeah. adjusted all the settings so for really what i was doing was i was getting a basic starting point for all of these photos and then i went back and once i'd done that i think once you've done something like that it is much easier to pick out of the batch of, of each little selection which one or maybe two you want to keep so once you narrowed it down to one, then you started narrowing in on where you wanted to draw the eye. Yes. I saw her doing this. So is that where you were bringing in the radial filters? Or? I used radio, uh, radial. That also. <laughs> <laughs> I, used, I used radial filters a lot. I am kind of lazy. I don't like to paint on stuff unless I absolutely have to. But honestly, I think a radial filter gives a more natural look, especially when you're trying to use light to draw attention. That's really mm -hmm. what I was trying to do. I wasn't giving extra sharpening or changing certain things in, you know, where I really needed to brush things on. And radial filter with a nice kind of soft feather is a really nice way to do this. And I did that and I copied the radial filter and then adjusted them accordingly. So, so basically in one day you were able to go from setting up all your food, setting up your set area mm -hmm. and importing them, post-processing them, and then getting them exported out. I did that, yes. Actually, I exported them the next morning because I hadn't fine-tuned some of them. Okay. But I basically had one from each little set of set, set up that I had with the photos. I had one from each that I had exported. And in some cases I had two because here's the thing. I want, what What do we use? 16 by 9. Yeah. 
for my blog post headers. And I wanted, I really like that, that crop. But I post a lot of my stuff on Instagram. So my other one is square crop. And I've decided to forego everything that goes in between. They, they can kind of figure it out. Square yeah. works on Facebook and in other places. But Instagram's very specific. And my blog posts, I'm very specific about consistency. And so there were some photos where I literally, and I was mindful while I was taking the photos. Mm. I need a square crop. And I want to, you know, I want my uh, 16 by 9. I just wanted to add in when I was setting things up, there were times when I had to rearrange things. I tried not to touch the food on the board because obviously I'm trying to keep it clean. But there were times when I rearranged things on the side that were not disturbing, like maybe a measuring jug, some water, a bowl of fruit. I'm just throwing things out there, the material. But I wanted to fill the frame and draw the eye through it. I didn't want it to look all cluttered up in one spot. And that kind of goes back to something that we say continuously on the podcast is to begin with the end in mind. Yeah. You knew what you wanted to see. I mean, you might not have known exactly what the colors were, go- were going to be, but you knew the basic composition of what you wanted to put together and what story you wanted to tell. That's right. Yeah. And then you were able to get through that basically in one day and then crop them out and, and edit, export them the next day. Yep. I mean, including making all like genuinely making all the meals it usually takes me what about, th- I'd say about three hours on a Sunday afternoon this entire thing took me about four and a half hours. The uploading and the basic processing, which for a lot of these were actually, was the final processing, cropping and, and exporting. That probably took me, I'd say under an hour, more than the 45 minutes or even under that for the entire thing. Because okay. I'm, I'm really quick. I, and I used to always say I'm lazy and it's part of that. But honestly, I just... Like everybody else, I'm I'm really pressed for time. I don't have the luxury of spending a day working on photos. I, I've got so much else I need to do. So I have to find a system that works for me and not make myself feel like I've taken a shortcut or like my stuff is any less. Well, you're basically yeah. doing this in a batch. In other words, yeah. you, you had to go cook all the food anyways. You were yeah. doing your food prep. And all you really did in that process is at a stage where you could take your photos and show them. And then go do the next prep and take the next photo. And within a day, you've got content or photos and material that you can drip out over the next however many weeks or months. Which is what I'm going to do. So not everything is up, but um, I'm quite happy to share photos for our... We'll, we'll put a couple of things yeah. that are that are I'm, on. I'm happy to share with you. I mean, I, it's, not, it's not like it's any top secret. I just don't have a story to go with it. So the photo is the story. But I'm quite happy to share with you just to give you an idea um, of, of what happened. And what I would say is just keep in mind, I know the holidays are coming up. There are all these great, there's so much pretty food and delicious food over the holidays. Mm. And, you know, there's also stuff that's special to families. And you want to capture some of that. If you have only your cell phone with you, use your cell phone to do it. You can actually take some wonderful photos of that. I do not recommend trying to do a full-on photo shoot unless you're the one cooking and you do not have pressure on you because even with something non-pressurized, this dragged out the time that it ordinarily would have taken to, I'd say, double. And I, I was tired. I've got a lot of stamina, but I, I was done when I was done. Yeah, but this gave you something, not only did you prepare the food for your family, but also gave you something for your clients that you can share and say, you can do this too. And this is how you're going to get through your journey to, to meet your goal. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much for joining us on the Photo Flunky Show. We hope you enjoyed today's episode about food prep photography and the story that you can tell with almost anything that you're planning on doing with your photography. So we want to let you know that show notes are going to be available at williambean.com slash episode 148. And we have one favor to ask. If you would, just go ahead and subscribe to the podcast on iTunes. If you're listening on your device, you can go ahead and subscribe there. You can go to williambean.com slash iTunes, and that'll take you to a link where you can subscribe. Or just go to photoflunky.com. Not only do we have a player there with our other episodes, but you can also subscribe on Google Play, Spotify, iHeartRadio, whatever makes you happy. Thank you so much. We'll see you again next week.